thanks for joining me. I'm Laura, and today we're going to talk about the history of the Texas Tommy. I was going to do a combined history and Texas Tommy lesson, but there was a lot of history, and there's a lot to say about the move itself, so I separated them into two different videos. But first, thank you people of Patreon for helping to support me and making this video free for everybody in the world, including people like you. I really appreciate what you do, and if you want to join them, it's a voluntary subscription. The link is in the description. Let's get started. First off, the Texas Tommy isn't just a move, it was a whole complete dance on its own. And we can't know exactly what that dance looked like because video footage is scarce. Like, I think this is the only one. If you know of more, let me know. Sidebar, sometimes this move and the whole dance is also called the Apache or the Apache or the Apache, which is a totally different dance with a different history and is super interesting, but we're not gonna go over it in this video. Time. The Texas Tommy was first danced by the black population of the Barbary Coast of San Francisco. Hang on, can we check out a different map of the original Barbary Coast? Does that say Barbaria? Dang it, history, you always do this. Anyhow, the Texas Tommy was incredibly popular because of its athleticism and speed. It embodied the rebellious youth culture of the time. It was danced to the most cutting edge, fashionable music of the time, which is rag music. And it was the most popular in the United States between around 1906 to 1912. Some people believe that the Texas Tommy is an ancestor of Lindy Hop because it's one of the very first dances that features that breakaway or open position moment. But other people disagree because the basic footwork of Texas Tommy is very different. Ethel Williams, who was an original Texas Tommy performer, described the basic footwork as a kick and a hop three times on each foot and then whatever you want. Turning, pulling, sliding, your partner had to keep you from falling. I've slid into the orchestra pit more than once. Wow, that is nuts. The Texas Tommy was also the very first dance to be described of as swing, which later arguably became the most important music and dance craze of the early 20th century. Now this is surprising, but according to interviews with famous Texas Tommy dancers from back in the day, the Texas Tommy source material, including possible movement vocabulary, does indeed come from Texas. <laughs> but the dance developed into a recognizable form in the Barbary Coast. Also, the word Tommy is slang for prostitute, which was a huge problem for the upright citizens of America. They tried to shut down the dance halls where it was danced, they picketed performances, even the Pope got involved. People were scandalized. But when they saw the dance, they were kind of surprised because there's like really nothing bad about it, it was mainly just athletic. So how did the Texas Tommy make its way around the United States? Well, the short answer is stage productions. It was common practice for performers to go slumming, meaning going into black society and checking out what the cool kids are doing and maybe stealing it. From what I understand, sometimes these performers learned the Texas Tommy themselves. Sometimes original Texas Tommy dancers were incorporated into touring performance troops. The Barbary Coast always had super exciting material because it was notorious across the United States for its danger and moral abandonment. Johnny Peters and Mary Dawson were two of the original dancers who toured the Texas Tommy all over the United States and their troupe was run by famous actor Al Jolson, who was the same person who starred in The Jazz Singer, the very first talking picture. And in that movie, he was in blackface. This is the time we're talking about. The history of The Jazz Singer is a little complicated. For one, calling it the first talking picture is a little inaccurate. Also, though he's currently a symbol of racism because of his use of blackface, Al Jolson as a performer and his relationship to black performers at the time is incredibly nuanced and interesting. Unfortunately, we don't have time to get into it, but check out my sources in the description to find out more. Anyway, Peters actually claimed that he learned the dance from his uncle in Galveston, Texas. Pew, 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 pew. And when a dance hits the stage, sometimes certain things happen to give the people what they want. In this case, the dancers frequently dressed in cowboy and cowgirl costumes and carried around pistols, which, as someone born and bred in small town Texas, I can verify we do all the time. Pew, 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 pew. Also, just a note, we've seen that costume stuff in Lindy Hop history as well. Now, in spite of the costumes, by all accounts, the Texas Tommy was a wildly popular part of these shows. The dancers were lauded for their athleticism, speed, and talent. Notable New York performances were the 1911 Ziegfeld Follies and the 1913 Dark Darktown Follies, which premiered in the Lafayette Theater. The Darktown Follies was a big production of all black entertainers and actually marked the beginning of the nightly migration by white people into Harlem in search of entertainment, which is a trend that would continue on for years to come, most notably in establishments like the Cotton Club, where black people entertained, but only whites were the clientele. 
Lindy Hop history is American history. Let's have a palate cleanser. Some fun Texas Tommy quotes in Caroline and Charles H. Caffins' description of the dance in their 1912 book, Dancing and Dancers of Today. The Texas Tommy performer's evolutions require absolute precision and dexterity of movement. There is, however, a certain wild, nervous verve, an exuberance of energy and vitality in their wonderful tour de force that suggests a purely physical well-being of hardy bodies with muscles all taut, clear eye and cool head of folks who look death in the face without wincing. And another quote, because these are fun. The whirl, which spins his partner towards the footlights with such momentum that without aid she must assuredly fly across them, must be nicely adjusted so that in neither force nor direction shall she escape the restraining grasp of his hand outstretched just at the right moment to arrest her. His weight must be braced to counterbalance hers. Poise and gentleness of hand must regulate the seemingly fierce toss of his partner first in air, then towards the ground, otherwise she would be battered to pieces across the outstretched leg over which he bends her before restoring her to her normal balance. <sighs> I do love old quotes. As the dance became more popular, more and more people wanted to do it, so it was capitalized on by famous ballroom dancers of the day, including the most famous, Vernon and Irene Castle. Original Texas Tommy dancer Ethel Williams, who we heard of at the very beginning of this video, said that Irene Castle actually called her at her home and asked to be taught some steps, which Ethel Williams was hugely proud of. Irene is a star, and she's asking you for a lesson. But. Did Irene Castle give Ethel Williams any credit? And how much money did the Castles make off of the Texas Tommy? Additionally, in order to make the Texas Tommy more palatable to the upper and middle class clientele, it needed to be altered, to be tamed. In their 1914 dance instructional book, the Castles write, do not wiggle the shoulders, do not shake the hips, do not twist the body, do not flounce the elbows, do not pump the arms, do not hop, Glide instead, drop the turkey trot, the grizzly bear, and the bunny hug. These dances are ugly, ungraceful, and out of fashion. Sidebar, dance instructional book, that's got to be a very hard way to learn. Side sidebar, you know that Vernon and Irene Castle weren't the only ones learning original dances, then watering them down for the white clientele, and making more money off of those dances than the people who invented the dances. This was common practice back in the day, and still is. Side side sidebar. So you have this dance that everyone loves for its athleticism and energy, but then in order to get more people to do it and for it to be accepted by broader culture, you gotta take out all that pesky athleticism and energy. You gotta tame it, break it down, explain it, and make things right or wrong. And this is kind of the history of vernacular social dance in general. A group of people co-invented dance based on their own music and movement traditions. And the dance is gorgeous, so gorgeous that other people want to do it. What this is with hip hop is everything's down low. It all is in a plie. But the new people come from a different culture with different dance and music traditions. And so they change the dance a little bit in order to understand it. Now sometimes the change is small, but sometimes it's massive. Sometimes it's made from genuinely trying to understand and appreciate. And sometimes it's made from just ignorance or trying to make some money. And this happened even before Texas Tommy met the stage. Way back in San Francisco, there's a local dance expert named Val Harris, who's credited with codifying the steps into an understandable format for his white patrons. He also is credited with writing the lyrics to Texas Tommy Swing, of course there's a song. I feel like Margaret Badichek describes this evolution really well in her thesis on Lindy Hop. Throughout the history of American social dance, new dances that have been introduced by the black community have first shocked, then been accepted by white society, and then capitalized upon. Unfortunately, sometimes by the time this happens, the dance is so changed that only the name reminds us that it is the same dance. From black performance of Cakewalk, to Charleston, to Lindy, to Breaking, this is the case. The structure may be present, but the feeling is gone. And this is one of the reasons why at the end of my videos I say that Lindy Hop is a black dance no matter who dances it. It's because it is. And it's important to remember, acknowledge, and support the culture, music, and dance traditions that it came out of. 
because culture fundamentally changes how a thing is done. Of course it does. And so in order to do it well, and in order to not harm it, in my opinion, it's important to learn about and have contact with the culture. I want to do the thing well, and I want to cause no harm to this thing I love. Black entertainers, white audiences, appropriation of black art, giving black artists credit. These are big issues that are still relevant today. And if you're not sure how to help, consider donating to the Black Lindy Hoppers Fund. They are actively preserving the culture of Lindy Hop and they're linked in the description. It's not gonna fix everything, but it's a baby step and baby steps help get you there. Anyhow, the history of the Texas Tommy is super interesting and it's even longer than this. And if you wanna learn more about it, check out Rebecca Strickland's master's thesis linked in the description. She found a lot of really hard to find stuff. I hope you learned a lot, I sure did. If you did too, click like, subscribe, comment, the algorithm, all of that stuff. Half of the money that I get from this YouTube channel goes towards organizations that support African diasporic artists and art, including Black Lindy Hopper's Fund, because Lindy Hop is a black dance, no matter who dances it. Oh,